those of you who've been here before know that the University Interdisciplinary Colloquium exists to celebrate uh, the contributions of the arts and humanities to interdisciplinary projects. And interdisciplinarity has a tendency to be associated in the minds of at least some folks on campus with uh, the sciences, uh, health sciences, STEM, and so forth. And lost often are the important and even and very innovative contributions of humanists and artists to interdisciplinary collaboration. And this colloquium series is a small effort on the part of the MSU Center for Interdisciplinarity and the College of Arts and Letters to change that uh, uh, understanding, sort of to change how people on campus think about interdisciplinarity so, that, so as to put the arts and humanities a little bit closer to the center. This is a, a series that meets six times a semester. So as I said, this is the first one of the semester. There will be five more. The next one will be on the 22nd of February in this room. Um, Zachary Kaiser from Art, Art History and Design will speak and give a, a talk entitled The Redistribution of the Sensible, Building an Interdisciplinary Interventionist Praxis. So that's in three weeks uh, on the 22nd of February uh, in here. In the meantime, there are a few other things that the Center for Interdisciplinarity is sponsoring that I wanted to mention. Um, we'll have a brown bag in South Kedzie 530, which is the philosophy department conference room, on the 13th of February uh, from 12 to 1.30. That will be delivered by Dr. Bennett Holman, a visitor on campus and a visitor with the center. That talk will be entitled, Dr. Watson, The Impending Automation of Diagnosis and Treatment. So that's on the 13th of February. After this session, as um, is true of all of the University Interdisciplinary Colloquia, there will be a coffee hour that is sponsored by uh, the Center for Interdisciplinarity that will uh, take place back in uh, South Kedzie. So in our conference room, 523, you're all invited to join us. Uh, basically what we do is take the coffee and sweets that are on the table back there that don't get consumed, take them back to, the, to South Kedzie with us, and then share them with you again. So um, we'd love to have you join us for that hour, if, if, even just for a few minutes, if, uh, if you have that time for you. Today, we're very excited to have with us Dr. Marissa Brandt, who is teaching professor in the history of, philosophy, history of philosophy and sociology of STEM in Lyman Briggs College. Dr. Brandt uh, will be providing more information of an introductory sort about herself in her presentation in just a few minutes. Um, but I, I didn't want to have her just get started without a proper introduction. It's not, that's not the appropriate way to do this. So I wanted to make sure that uh, um, we talked a little bit uh, about why uh, Dr. Brandt is uh, kicking off the University of Interdisciplinary Colloquium for the spring. Um, the, the, the most obvious reason is that she's a very interdisciplinary scholar right, who functions um, as, a, as a scholar and as a teacher at, at the, the margins of a lot of different areas. Um, she's done a lot of cool work at the intersection of feminism, technology, and STS, and has also worked uh, collaboratively. Um, her thoughtfulness about interdisciplinarity in the context of both scholarship and teaching really make her a natural for the interdisciplinary colloquium. I think in the past, you know, we've had two semesters of these talks. Um, most of the talks, I, I think, have focused on uh, sort of the scholarly side of our identity as, as uh, interdisciplinary academics. Um, and today, I think what we'll see is a, 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 some attention paid uh, a little more closely to the teaching side of our identity. And so it's uh, really exciting for us to highlight how interdisciplinarity involving the arts and humanities can um, inform innovative pedagogy. Um, with that, I will uh, yield the floor to Dr. Brandt, who will be delivering a talk entitled Reimagining First Year Writing for STEM Students as Experiential Learning and Science Studies. Dr. Brandt. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about um, primarily about a curriculum project that I'm leading at Lyman Briggs College and I want to tell you a little bit about my journey of how I got there and um, how I've been sort of thinking and, and bringing interdisciplinary thinking to um, my approach to this project. So um, 
in the past, I've seen that these presentations often are a little bit autobiographical at the beginning, so I wanted to introduce myself. You can all um, thank me for later for um, using this as the picture of UCSD and not the ones from the alumni magazine that were making me cry uh, when they arrived uh, recently because of, um, if you've never been to UCSD, it's on the beach, basically, uh, in San Diego. And most of the pictures highlighting it are like, here's the kid's skateboard. Anyway, so that was where I went to graduate school, and that was also a really interesting place to think about interdisciplinarity. UCSD is really known for um, its engineering, biotech. It's located in what was uh, formerly called Biotech Beach. There's a lot of military influence. Um, but nevertheless, it's also a great place to do humanistic and social science research. So I completed my PhD there in 2013 in a dual degree program in communication and science studies. So a little background on that. Communication at UCSD is kind of different from um, most traditional communications departments. Um, it focuses on kind of three areas, interpretation, uh, institutions and interactions and you get trained in kind of all three of those and almost none of the faculty actually in that program have PhDs in communication they come from all over um, and then my I also did this kind of dual degree program in science studies uh, at UCSD, which is one of the, the first places to do graduate uh, training in science studies in the US. Um, and that was also very interesting for interdisciplinarity, because not only are we humanists and social scientists studying the sciences, but we ourselves were a collection of historians, philosophers, sociologists, and communication scholars. So um, I think Michael was right when he said, I, I'm on the margins of a lot of different disciplines. I, I dare say I, I'm almost an, an undisciplined scholar, but I, I kind of uh, like it that way. I dabble in a lot of things. Um, also, so um, being at UCSD, uh, I also got an opportunity. I spent five years working in one of the college writing programs called Culture, Art, and Technology. And that was where I got a lot of experience um, teaching first year writing primarily to engineering students of um, various kinds, some business students. Um, but already trying to think about um, how to bring humanistic thinking uh, to students from other disciplines. Um, I was also a, a teaching fellow there. But that background really informs a lot of my, my thinking um, in this uh, curriculum redevelopment effort. Uh, also, I wanted to give homage to my advisor, uh, Chandra Mukherjee, who led a writing group um, all through college and really was very motivating for um, for me and uh, often would be tr uh, convey Yoda-like wisdom about the writing process. So shout out to her. My research, before I get to this project, um, has mostly been um, looking at uh, innovations in technology and healthcare. So my dissertation work was um, on the making of clinical virtual reality, uh, and that was work that I did in um, field work that I did in 2010, 2011, looking at sort of like the military influence, especially on that field and military funding um, for that field, which is something I think most people don't know about um, during that big period between um, the VR hype of the 80s and the 90s and what we're seeing now, military sustained a lot of these innovations. And so that was a lot of the kind of work that I did was um, hanging out with the scientists, going to the scientific conferences, seeing um, what kind of work they do to advance the technology and try to create legitimacy for these novel innovations. I also do work, um, I've, but, uh, well, but my work, like I said, has been fairly broad. Um, and my teaching uh, is perhaps even a little bit broader. So these are some of the kinds of course topics that I teach. Um, basically bringing together sort of feminist critical approaches to um, technological innovation in media to think about things like VR, simulation, but also reaching into areas like bioethics. Um, I do work on science in the media. So anyway, these are some of the, the background of sort of work that I do if you're interested in any of those kinds of projects and want to talk about that uh, afterwards or perhaps collaborate. Uh, oh, just real quick. This is uh, a um, GMO-free Zapatista corn seeds. So sometimes I look at things like um, 
GMOs and biotechnology innovation, and this is uh, an indigenous group's kind of response to that um, innovation. This is uh, a edited volume of short stories about cyborgs that students wrote for a class that I taught on cyborgs and science fiction. And here's another group of my students um, uh, in a class on simulation uh, at the um, in Fee Hall in the Learning and Assessment Center getting CPR training as a way to think about what simulation looks like. That's some of the stuff I'm up to. So broadly, I like to do projects that help students to think about their world, how it's changing, and often have kind of hands-on and creative components to um, learning and assessment. In 2015, I joined the faculty here at Lyman Briggs College, um, which, uh, are any of you unfamiliar with, with Briggs? Okay, so Briggs is about 50 years old, and we have the tagline of being the place on campus that bridges the sciences and the humanities. And so what does that really mean? Well, in part it means um, that uh, our students um, live in the building, and we have labs and classrooms in the building, um, and also about half of our faculty are on the HPS side, and half of our faculty are in um, STEM. It's a very interesting place to uh, think about what kinds of scientists we are creating uh, going into the future and what kind of role the humanities can play in that. A little bit of background on our students. Um, so I thought this might be an interesting slide just for those of you um, who are less familiar with the college. Um, this is some data I got from our administrators about what our students major in. So we say we're a college of the sciences, but if you really look at it, the vast majority of our students are in human biology and neuroscience, um, with about 100 in physiology. And then past that, it kind of tapers off very steeply. Any ideas why we might have all those majors? Like that? Pre-meds. It's a very, very big attractor for pre-med students. So a lot of our students coming in um, want to go into health professions with a, it's maybe a small number also seeking like um, veterinary sciences. But they largely, they're very interested in um, medicine and practical applications of science. They're also very good students, um, very uh, generally very strong. Um, some of the uh, kind of perhaps uh, braggy uh, details about our students. They uh, tend to have a higher GPA average than um, the rest of the university. Um, many of them placed uh, high in math. Nine out of 10 Briggs students graduate from MSU and eight out of 10 who are qualified, um, or, yeah, who are qualified for medical school uh, or grad school get in. So this is uh, an opportunity um, for us as scholars who teach these students um, especially in the HPS classroom, where we're really thinking about um, putting their understanding of science in a broader context. It gives us an opportunity to really think about, you know, students who aspire to be future leaders, future professionals, um, and to really shape their understanding of what kinds of roles and responsibilities they have uh, as they pursue those skills. Um, this slide is, oh, unfortunately, you can't read it very well. Um, so recently at Briggs, we've been, um, we have a new dean, and we've been thinking a lot about what our identity is and what our trajectory is. What makes an education at Briggs so special, and how can we really double down on that identity? Um, one of the things that Dean Jackson uh, highlighted here is, right, we believe that understanding science in its social, historical, and philosophical context makes us wiser, more insightful, and more engaged in the world that we live in. So um, this is, you know, kind of our mandate a bit for HPS, to help our students be wiser, more insightful, and more engaged in the world that they live in. Um, and this uh, follows along with some of the other kind of trajectories and visions that we have for the college, which include things like overall creating an accessible and inclusive uh, STEM education community to um, foster inter interdisciplinarity, though that's something that we're also talking a lot about. What does that mean to us um, in the classroom? 
and also to foster kind of more experiential learning experiences to help our students to gain hands-on experiences that they reflect on as a part of their training. So let me bring you to our problem child of the talk. So most of our students, um, about 80% of our students, take this class called LB133. Um, and the full title, get ready, is the Introduction to the History, Philosophy, and Sociology of Science, but really uh, of Science, Technology, the Environment, and Medicine. So if you put that all together, that's about 12 permutations of things that we could be covering in this first year class. In addition to that, it's also um, the first year tier one writing requirement. Um, so uh, most people in the university take uh, RAC 101, I believe, as their tier one writing course, though I believe some of the other residential colleges also have um, their versions. Ours is, um, is 133. And so 133 um, is an interesting course because it serves a lot of purposes, right? We're supposed to be teaching the students these fundamental skills that they're supposed to understand for writing, how to create an argument, to read at a college level, to um, work with uh, sophisticated materials um, at a college level. Um, but it's also this place where we're trying to teach HPS kinds of concepts, right? To help them reflect on their role um, in society and the role of science more broadly. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, you know, when you, when you join the faculty of Briggs, um, you find out you're gonna teach 133 and you say, okay, well, what, what exactly do I need to do uh, in order to cover these 12 permutations and make sure that I'm teaching college writing? And unfortunately, we've kind of come to a place where there isn't really a coordinated vision of what that looks like. Um, so we, we kind of have each sort of interpreted what 133 means for ourselves. Um, the class has a long history, right? It's been a kind of a core part of our curriculum um, for, uh, throughout the duration of the college. It was originally team taught, often interdisciplinarily, um, with shared texts across the sections, um, and an emphasis on kind of traditional composition-based skills. Um, but as I said, over time, um, we've kind of lost that coherence uh, of the course, right? And so part of my um, effort to try to understand uh, this course and its purpose was looking over three, uh, three years worth of syllabi of how the course has been taught. It was very interesting, right? It's kind of all over the place from uh, innovations in biotechnology, the ethics of experimentation, studies of controversies, lots of great topics, a lot of great ideas, lots of great um, projects, but very different experiences for the different students coming in. And because they live in a building together, right? They're in a res hall. This creates certain challenges for us, right? The students talk to each other. They know, they uh, gossip about who's the easy instructor and the difficult instructor, um, who has more work or less work. So it kind of works against us too, to not have as much coordination. Um, and that's something that we uh, really want to work on also as a way to um, create more of a culture to support learning in our classrooms. Um, also, we did kind of briefly do an experiment with the writing studios or with the writing centers on campus to kind of have almost like a subcontracted out writing instruction mentor program. Um, and that lasted for about six years until we kind of realized that what was going on with our mentoring as a way of being able to teach writing wasn't necessarily teaching the, all of the fundamental skills and was also kind of uneven between different sections. So, so there's a kind of general sense at Briggs right now that we could do something really cool with, with 133, we just need to make it happen. So my background, um, again, bringing my background to this course, um, I was really inspired by my training in science studies. So science studies is a field, is an interdisciplinary field, focused on the question, or rather the methodology, of studying scientific practices and context, whether we do this historically or sociologically. Um, it's really a focus on scientific practices, how 
uh, who are scientists, what do they do, where do they do it, how does this knowledge actually get made, and how does it become contested. And so many authors have um, suggested that there's something of value um, for uh, STEM students in taking this, using science studies as a kind of metacognitive tool, right? An opportunity for them to reflect on themselves and their experiences in science. This is what I'm currently reading, um, Isabel Stanger's Another Science is Possible, where she kind of articulates um, how science studies could help us understand why there's so much pressure for science to move quickly and asks us what might happen if we allow some of the messiness of the world to get into science and slow down by asking things like hard ethical questions, political questions, controversial questions. So when I got here thinking, okay, I'm gonna make a science studies focused course um, for 133, I got together with my other fellow new um, colleagues, uh, Megan Halpern and Isaac Record, and we uh, unfortunately can't see this because it's a little it's a little blurry. But we took over a whiteboard and really um, dove into what we thought would make a really interesting science studies focused class. Um, and I'll get in, you can maybe see GMOs and all these kinds of different ways that we were thinking about how we could develop projects that support science studies learning. Um, again, science studies uh, is getting a lot of kind of public attention these days. Uh, Bruno Latour, probably um, both best, uh, much derided as a science studies scholar for um, people who thought that his vision of actor network theory and his approach to social construction sort of undermined science. Um, He's now kind of on a big uh, tour these days talking about how science, the study of scientific practices is actually very valuable. Um, it's not about undermining science by showing how it's made, but by actually by um, empowering people to understand the skills and the craftsmanship and the work that goes into producing knowledge, right? So in an era of post-truth where we're very skeptical about what happens on the surface, um, people like Latour um, and Stangers and others suggest that going deeper into science, right, actually bringing in thing, messy things and like values um, and trying to articulate what role those plays in science, stepping away from the myth of perfect objectivity, right, um, is a way for us to perhaps move forward uh, in this post-truth moment where we have such a crisis of trust. So um, I'm not... Uh, you know, the only person talking about this. There's a lot of um, recent uh, literature looking at the role of STEM in, um, or the role of science studies in STEM. Uh, our own Kevin Elliott from Briggs has been doing some really nice work lately on um, scientific values and arguing related to a lot of science studies, similar to a lot of science studies scholars, that scientists should be more um, transparent about their values. So bringing, bringing this background in, um, I have some personal goals for what I thought this class should be like. So one goal right, is to effectively teach and motivate STEM students to learn how to write, uh, especially these fundamental writing skills. And often they come to us and they're not really interested in learning to write. Right? They have this idea that they're coming to um, English class, they don't want to write about literature, um, and they, they often have, a, um, not always, but they often have some resistance to this class as a, rich, as a required class um, outside of their major, and especially often outside of their identity, right? Because they see themselves as, um, as STEM students, right? And they've kind of consciously, in many ways, often rejected that more humanistic side of thinking. And so kind of our job is you know, to to uh, teach them that one, these are valuable skills that they will actually learn, and also a bit to sort of seduce them into the HPS vision. So um, uh, my approach to doing this was to really, to change what I thought of as a writing project. Um, and that was inspired by many kind of workshops that I attended on things like digital humanities, experiential learning conferences. Um, and what I realized was that from years in teaching this uh, CAT first year writing program, students aren't often very excited about the idea of just writing about the text that is assigned in class or the text or the ideas assigned in class. 
So what I wanted to do was develop inquiry-based projects that put them in the um, position of making knowledge um, using science studies inspired methods to give them experiences to write about rather than just text to write about. Um, and the, the, um, my design challenge was really, I thought, to challenge stereotypes for them, to change and shift their view um, about science. So this includes who scientists are, how scientists produce knowledge, how scientific knowledge circulates, and when and why scientific knowledge is contested, which I think are kind of important issues and foundational issues for all of our students to think about um, as they develop their scientific identities uh, and think about what the role of science in society is. And ideally, right, these projects should show, rather than tell, as they would get from a reading, the utility of HPS for opening up inquiry into real-world scientific practices and problems. So I want, them, I want them to kind of intuit their way into um, HPS through these, these projects. So some of the things that we do, I should pass this around. So uh, part of the way that we support this, or that I support this, um, as well as Megan and, and Isaac and others who've been kind of participating in, in this growing dialogue is to create inductive inquiry-based classroom experiences that encourage the students to use writing as a way to, to collect data, reflect on their observations, and communicate knowledge. Now increasingly, as I talk to my STEM colleagues, right, this is exactly how they think about writing. Right? For them, they're not interested in the students just being able to summarize some theory. Right? They want their students, um, they do very like, hands-on, lab-based kinds of work. Right? They want their students to have experiences, collect their data, uh, reflect on their observations, and communicate knowledge, right? So why should HPS be any different is kind of my philosophy. If these students are active, hands-on learners, let's give them active, hands-on situations to help them think about these concepts. So over here, um, this is in the, uh, the cell, the collaborative experiential learning laboratory that we um, opened just a couple years ago that's full of Legos and a VR headset and 3D printers and all kinds of fun stuff. That's basically our makerspace. And um, here you see some of my students with a black box or with a few black boxes trying to figure out what's in inside while following the rule that they cannot open it. And so this is a really fun kind of project for them to do, to think about what is the nature of scientific inquiry? How are they going about this practice of trying to figure out what's in the box? Are they using inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning? Are they posing hypothesis? What rules do their tools play? Um, but I also like to play a little game where I have a uh, few people circulate and also do people watching, right? Little mini ethnography. So what did you learn by observing how these folks um, tried to figure out how to uh, what was inside the box, and they realized things like, oh, when one table figures out you know, a new tool to use, the next table just kind of copies them without communicating, right? And we get to have a whole conversation about what kinds of scientific practices they're engaging in um, and values they're expressing by taking that path. Um, other kinds of activities include things like reflecting on documentaries. Um, if you haven't seen it, the Netflix documentary, The Bleeding Edge, is a really good way to get pre-med students to think twice about um, medical technologies. It looks at l a lot of the problems in the medical device approval uh, process. Um, and so building on that project, I had the students um, identify the different stakeholders that were involved in that movie and use that as a way to kind of collect data in order to structure an argument imagining if they were going to make a website that would explain why one of the technologies featured in the movie was controversial, right? How would they structure their data in such a way um, to make that claim and who, which of the various stakeholders would they um, include in what order, right? Including doctors, um, pharmaceutical companies, the FDA, that kind of thing. And to get them to think about what kind of story they're telling by um, putting this data in different uh, organizations. Well, let me come back to this. So that's kind of generally the kinds of thing that I'm trying to think of uh, to do with them in the classroom. But I'm also trying to think about ways, um, again, to challenge their stereotypes. 
So I won't go into so much detail about each of these, but you know, one, so one question, to regard the question who scientists are, you know, I have represented by the draw a scientist test, um, which is a way to kind of gauge what students sort of cultural stereotypes are about who scientists can be. We also see, often see them in lab coats with Erlenmeyer flasks, crazy hair, that kind of thing. Um, so to try to um, challenge that, uh, we try to include more diverse representations of scientists, but also to get them to write a personal statement that gets them to reflect on themselves it, uh, and their relationship to the scientific profession. Even if they don't want to be a scientist, what do they want to be and what kind of role does science play in that? Um, with regards to how scientific knowledge is produced, um, you know, the, it, there's um, no denying in our culture that if you look at pop culture or you watch movies or uh, TV shows like CSI, science seems to happen very fast, very unproblematically. Um, and, you know, in the course of an episode, you can have a discovery of the murderer or a new, uh, you know, cure or whatever. Um, and that's how I try to set up um, the second big project, which is a collaborative project where um, the students go to a scientific site. Um, previously, it was a lab on campus, but I think we're going to try to open it up um, to more places. And the idea there is that they will go and actually get to talk to some scientists, uh, hopefully in an area that they're interested in, and write a paper about what they learned about how scientific knowledge actually gets made, right? And think about things like the tools, the values, the communication work, all these things that you know, just don't really get uh, communicated as much when you just think, boom, you know, scientific solution. Uh, this is a, uh, a slide from one of my student projects from this lab study, um, them kind of reflecting on what they saw when they went to this um, psychology and perception lab. And so the third thing that I'm trying to um, combat is how scientific knowledge circulates. My students come in, they think, well, you know, if I read it and someone said it was scientific, it's probably true. Right? Science says is very real to them. So we spend a lot of time with this project called Unpacking a Fact, where we look at facts um, in kind of folklore or that kind of uh, pass as sort of folklore. Um, spinach is a good source of iron. You need to walk 100 or no, 10,000 steps a day. Um, popular representations of various claims, and then we trace them back to the scientific source. And in the Unpacking of Fact paper, they compare what that um, claim looked like when it went to the public versus what it looked like at its scientific source. And it's often very surprising to them to see um, how much the data has changed along that path. And it also helps to make them more aware of the circuits through which scientific knowledge um, passes, right, from um, scientists, PR offices, um, into the media, online, et cetera. So that helps them get a much more, um, a lot of awareness, but also I think a bit of humility about um, the level of their own knowledge and understanding of science, right? Realizing just because they love science doesn't mean they really know science. Uh, and then finally, the last project, which is also a collaborative project, um, deals with when and why knowledge is created. So another common stereotype uh, among our students is if you disagree with a scientific claim, you're either, it, you know, for some of them it means you're, you know, you're dumb or, or scientifically illiterate, right? This kind of deficit model. For others, it's kind of, well, everybody just has their own opinion and I, I don't really need to think about it any further. Um, so this uh, Matters of Concern website is a project where um, the students uh, pick a case study of something that is controversial, and then each member of the group, four or five members usually, picks a different stakeholder that they're going to explore um, what role facts, values, and trust play in that person's, um, or that group, rather's, uh, orientation to the controversy. Why is it controversial to them? And then to try to, as a group, uh, so, and, and in order to understand that, they're working with primary sources. So this is also an opportunity for them to learn about 
um, different ki uh, even further than the previous project, different kinds of sources and what kind of value they have for helping us to understand the world. So I send them online, right? Try to find primary sources. Try to find what the, global ch or the, the climate change deniers actually believe or what they say they believe, right? How do they make their case? Don't just, uh, don't just respond to the memified version or somebody else's interpretation of that view, right? Actually get in there. And that can be very challenging to do that kind of perspective taking. But as a whole, they create this website where in the introduction they help to establish why this issue is controversial, give some important background, tell the story from different perspectives, and then consider what the, lesson, uh, the larger lessons are for students um, of science. This is uh, an example of what I thought was a really nice project. Um, some students decided to look at uh, the controversy over Nestle's rights to pump uh, water out of Lake Michigan. And they compared uh, Nestle's perspective on the topic, uh, Michigan residents, um, uh, the American people more broadly, and then I think also some uh, environmental scientists. So this was you know, an example of the kind of cool project that these students can do when they kind of put themselves in these diverse positions and realize that they have to come together as a group to understand this controversy. So that was kind of how I started thinking about the design of the course and how the course over the past four years has evolved as I've been teaching it. That's kind of the ideal form. So now as the leader of this effort to reform 133 for the university as a whole, I'm scaling up and I'm teaming up um, in order to think about how the lessons from this class that I've designed um, could be used more broadly across Briggs. Could this actually be a model that many of us would take up? And as you'll see here, there's a lot of things that uh, a lot of dreams that we've attached to this redesign goal, um, really around um, our lives, but also about shaping the students, right? We wanna establish fundamental writing um, uh, goals, establish some shared HPS content that we can assume they've all been exposed to, or at least more diverse than our individual areas of expertise. Um, not everybody likes to be quite as undisciplined as I do. Um, incorporate and leverage some experiential learning op opportunities. Um, to use HPS to cultivate a sense of curiosity to really help them see what they don't know and what questions they aren't asking yet about science's role in society. Um, and then hopefully also by making this more of a collective class than a kind of random, you know, whatever you get uh, assigned to, to help to foster a sense of belonging in the Briggs community especially among underrepresented groups in science. And finally, to build uh, more capa uh, capacity for collaborative teaching infrastructures and um, yeah, create also shared culture of writing across all our disciplines. Um, on top of that, we also want to foster some STEM dispositions, right? What kind of student are we hoping to make through classes like this? Hopefully ones that are curious, but have a little bit of humility about um, how much is known in science and, uh, and what kind of problems we're currently tackling and why. Uh, openness to new ideas and new perspectives, a sense of inclusivity, right? That there isn't just one kind of scientist, but many people who can contribute, um, as well as you know, critical thinking, um, perspective taking, and uh, some cross-disciplinary thinking. This is some of my students playing a game that they designed about the pharmaceutical industry. So that's pretty fun. And this is my team, so cool. Uh, so these are the uh, professors who are working with me at Briggs to think about how to scale up this class to make it um, something that many of us can teach and, and enjoy. Um, Isaac Record, who's our director of experiential learning. It's a little bit of a dream team, it's kind of great. Uh, Richard Parks, excellent teaching specialist. Sharon DeGraz taking our lead on um, writing instruction and really trying to help us find good uh, writing support tools. Mark Odell, who's a special advisor to the deed and also a really excellent teacher. Um, Arthur Ward was our current, uh, current sorry, our former director of uh, inclusivity. Um, and Georgina G Montgomery, our new um, associate dean of teaching and learning. So we're kind of, um, 
So where are we now? We're, um, oh, and then many other useful numbers. So where are we now? So we've created this kind of pilot structure. And the basic idea, so there's kind of two levels to this. One is um, the writing class. So right now the plan is that there's kind of two units to the course. The first unit kind of more focused on the culture of science or cult, um, and thinking about how values shape scientific practice and how um, practice is made. And that would be um, the individual project there would be the personal statement. Where, and then collaboratively, they do the um, scientific sites project. These are some of the writing skills that we hope to develop there. Um, and then in the second unit, to focus on what role do values play in the contestation of scientific facts, to get them to think about. Um, so we we'll start with the unpacking of fact paper, just to get them a little unseated with their own sureness of what is and isn't scientific. Um, and then this uh, Matters of Concern collaborative project is their last main project. But then, um, the last uh, component of this is that we're going to try to move the class, which um, had usually been on a two-day-a-week schedule, to a three-day-a-week schedule. And I'm calling this a kind of three-plus-one model, um, uh, with the idea being that we're teaching writing explicitly, right, and HPS through these kind of active experiential models um, Monday and Wednesday. And then on Friday, the dream is, well, how do we really help them get a sense of the diversity of HPS? Because there are so many different kind of um, scholars and um, as well as STEM faculty who are using science studies and HPS ideas in their own work. Um, why should we be the ones trying to present everybody else, and why should we each be trying to schedule guest speakers? So the dream is that um, if we set these up as cohorts at the same time, on Friday, the students would come together, and we would have a colloquium series, and they get to hear a series of talks. First half of the class, the talks would be focused on the culture of science, perhaps thinking about feminist approaches to teaching um, uh, physics or citizen science, right? Uh, and then the second half would be more about science in public um, and uh, uh, why it becomes contested and have guest speakers who can speak to those ideas. Um, my, uh, the administration in Briggs is very excited about this because one of the, the things that um, has also been a challenge to this class really being a, a focus of um, belonging and community in the college is that um, the students who have AP credit for writing test out of it. So one vision would be that the colloquium could become its own one unit course that students could also sign up for. And so even those who test out would still get this kind of exposure to HPS um, it, on Friday afternoons with a bunch of their friends. Uh, and this right now, so uh, where this is right now, we currently have two pilot cohorts scheduled for uh, next year. Um, and we're having bi weekly meetings to pick our readings and really try to finalize the vision of the course um, and plan the colloquium series. And then also um, thinking about um, student undergraduate teaching and learning um, research opportunities that we might uh, take up while we're doing this pilot, make some knowledge that we could all share, which I would be extremely interested to hear your own ideas about what would be some interesting things that you would uh, like to see written up about this work. So yeah, that is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you for attending, coming out. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Hmm. Great, but like, do you ever have discussions about where values come from? And whether or not in our interaction with our scientific practice, that's, it, it generates it the other way around. Uh, or just where does it come from? And I'm actually kind of negotiating that, that space. Like, I know, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about the whole virtues discussion, which of course also goes on, but like, 
Is there space for that? Yeah, well, so, so the idea of focusing values in unit one is something new. That this was like a revelation, like, oh, maybe I should be talking about values and not just people and practices and, and incorporating that in to create more coherence. In, in unit two, when I've introduced values, we do, when we're talking about different stakeholders, really try to talk about their values in relation to their, their situated experience. Um, so that they get to see that, that values are, are not universal, right? And different groups of people will have different values and that is a source of, of contestation. But I like the idea, you know, when we talk about things like the Mertonian norms, I try to problematize that for them a little bit. Like, this is about scientists trying to convince you of what their values are as much as it is, if not more so, their values, right? I try to emphasize um, observation, right? This is about ways that people communicate and, and make argumentation about themselves as well. So, other questions? Yeah. I wondered if you maybe say a little bit more about how you um, structure the collaborative writing assignments and experiences. That's something that I'm I've tried to do in my classes a little bit, and uh, I, I think it's, I mean, honestly, it's just, it's still mysterious for me a little bit how to yeah. do that. Um, no. So it's hard for me to teach students how to do it, but I'm curious what, what sort of um, techniques you use to make that happen. Yeah, um, so the, the question was to, since I'm supposed to repeat the question, the question was about how do, how do I actually integrate the collaborative writing into these projects? Um, let me try to go back up to the lab study. So it's actually different. I do it differently in the, in the two um, collaborative projects. So in the first collaborative project with the lab study, um, they are, one nice thing is that in Briggs, like our classrooms actually all have moving tables and things. So I, I literally put them together at tables with their collaborators. Um, and uh, they go to like the MSU um, research page and they try to find uh, labs and we talk about creating professional emails and I get CC'd on all these things. Um, what, I, what I mark for them as collaborative here is that they're going to the lab together and then as I'm training them up to go, we're talking about um, observation and the different ways that you can focus your attention to observe. And we do some projects around this. So I tell them, you know, each of you observing should be really coordinating thinking about what you're going to observe differently. You can't pay attention to everything. Um, and so each member of the group ends up being a kind of specialist, right? I'm really gonna focus on what they say. I'm really gonna focus on the materials in the room. I'm gonna really focus on trying to understand the experiment, right? These kinds of things. Um, and they create shared field notes, usually over Google Docs, and I tell them, this is your data, right? This is what you're writing the paper for. You need to write your, your notes well enough that your other classmates can read and understand it. And I say, anything that's not in your notes, you can't support as evidence in your paper, right? So I'm really trying to push them to do good work with that. But then they write individual papers. Um, but that's interesting to me still because then I can see the, the different ways that they interpret the same experience um, uh, from, from that. With the controversy project, um, so that's really more about shared research than it is um, shared writing. With the controversy project, um, I, like I said, I have um, each of them be responsible for a different stakeholder, but they make a, cre a collective annotated bibliography. And I also encourage them in class to have conversations with each other about their different stakeholders and kind of map those perspectives. So again, um, when they're writing their individual stakeholder pages on the website, those are individual. Um, but I tell them that they need to be working collaboratively to, to set the stage of the, exp of the controversy in the introduction and then um, in the conclusion as well. So, and that's about um, trying to get them to see how each of their stakeholder perspectives um, needs to be taken into account. And they usually also coordinate over Google Docs for that. But to, you know, I'm still learning about that, that actual kind of work. So I also had them do cover letters 
for this project so that I, and asked, you know, what did you contribute? And it was interesting. Sometimes I saw that they, they said, oh, well, I laid out the website and then I wrote the introduction and I wrote the conclusion. So I'm still, I'm still figuring it out, you know. It, without me asking that, I could have thought they were all collaborating on everything, right? But it, it makes it more visible to me. But that, so that's my solution for now and I'm open to, to newer ones. Other questions? Yeah, Robin. So I know one of the things that we've been talking about is how to better integrate HPS and STEM. And I'm just wondering from the overview that you gave of the pilot, um, is that mostly going to come out in the colloquium, or will that also be integrated into the first two days of the week as well? When, like, the role of our STEM colleagues in, yeah, in HPS? Yeah, so Yeah, um, so Rachel Barnard from chemistry and Shanaz Masani from biology um, have, been, have come to some of our meetings and I think these are the kinds of things we can, we can only really figure out um, how to integrate this, the STEM side of our college and the HPS side of our college um, through, through having conversations. So my hope is if we're having regular meetings, um, we can find out more about what's going on with folks. And we started having these conversations because there was a conversation earlier in the semester about writing, writing across the curriculum. I think you yeah. came to that, yeah. And where we articulated, right, that we want to share these ideas about claim, argument, and evidence. Um, but yeah, I'm opening up the lines of communication and I think the more, um, I think it's also motivating for our STEM colleagues to want to collaborate with us when they know that it's something that'll be able to scale. Um, because they have so many students, but we have 24 per section. So knowing, you know, potentially with this cohort model, um, we could ha we would actually know um, that all the students in this HPS cohort are in this chemistry class, which is not something that we can count on right now, right? So all of this is about, yeah, building infrastructure so we can do those kinds of cool things. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you.